some of the points from yesterday, it's clearly very obvious that we know what the problems are with our current system. And as is often said, a problem shared is a problem halved. So we've done 50% of the work. So mainly I want to point out that the law is a very underutilized tool in the advancement of patient safety. There are many ways in which we can explore its use, not just for punitive reasons, but also to build accountability into the system. So what's the situation now? Yesterday we heard on two occasions about the Institute of Medicine's report to, to Air is Human, which was published in 1999. Um, we saw that around that time, 98,000 deaths occurred as a result of medical errors. And that was quite high in relation to the other um, causes of death, like if you compared it to the figures for motor accidents, that was only about 43,000. Well, not only, it's still considerable, but if you compare it to um, deaths resulting from medical errors, it was much higher. Then breast cancer was about 42,000, and then AIDS, 16,000 in the US. However, in Ghana, we don't have any figures to put to this because we have no data on deaths and disability arising from medical errors. We also don't have a national complaint system or a national adverse reporting system. And every complaint can end up in a legal suit. And that's something that I think that we haven't quite um, grasped yet. Or maybe we have, but because of the way our cases are reported here, we haven't really seen the full ramification of that. We also have very few specific laws on health. And really, quality issues are legal issues in waiting. It's nice to see that now there's a growing realization of the need to improve quality standards and ensure patient safety. I read recently that Colibu is improving efforts in that area as well. And so now there's a 10-member QI central committee with a focal person in each department. That's great. OK, let's dive straight into two cases that I picked that would help us sort of look at the journey of a patient from start, from entering the facility to the very end. So Elizabeth Vi and Lister Fertility Center, this received a lot of media attention. This happened around the 23rd of October, 2010. And what happened was Mrs. Va started attending Lister to access antenatal services. Everything was fine until March 8th, 2011, when her membranes ruptured, and then she subsequently delivered a stillborn child the following day. According to the aut autopsy, the child passed away due to multiple organ hemorrhages. And they still weren't sure what exactly caused that. So subsequently, she asked for her medical records to be given to her so that it could assist in the future if she needed to be attended to by doctors in another medical facility or in the country or outside the country. But the hospital refused to release the records because they said that she had already spoken about it in the media, and because of that, they wouldn't do it unless the MDC or a court ordered them to do so. So she went ahead to the courts. Now, because we don't have any specific legislation for health at the time, she had to use a provision from the Constitution on right to information. And so you see there that those, there had to be a wide inter interpretation of the law for, for that to be used successfully. There's a lot of debate around how the decision was reached. The outcome was correct to order that her me medical records be released to her. However, the way in which it was reached um, has re received a lot of um, criticism. Then we look at Ernestina Kunedu. She had a cesarean section done at the Brongahafo Regional Hospital in Sinyane around the 7th of October, 2010. And she eventually lost the baby and left the hospital with pain in her stomach. 
and other complications. Later on, it was discovered that there was a towel left in her stomach. She sought compensation for the harm that had been caused to her and also the loss of a quality of life. I believe she used to work as a healthcare assistant, but following the incident, she lost her ability to do any form of work and had to be assisted constantly by someone. The hospital offered compensation of a thousand Ghana cities for leaving a towel in her stomach that rendered her disabled. Unfortunately, last year, she passed away in October, almost or just a little over six years after the incident. I don't know if you can see that clearly. So we're just looking here at the patient's journey. So the entry points can be a hospital, a clinic, a health center, even a chips compound, it can be any of those. And between then and the patients actually leaving the hospital or the center, wherever they, the, is their first point of call, so many things can happen. From slips and falls, when cleaning is being done, we don't have an occupational health and safety document that informs what that process would be if something like that should happen and maybe a person gets injured as a result. And then within the facility, you have the likes of mistaken identity, wrong sites, anesthetic deaths, as, and so on, as we talked about. And then you have one of five outcomes. The patient is either discharged, skipping happily home, and very happy, grateful to God for their healing through the doctors and the nurses. Or they get discharged because there aren't enough beds and they, are see, they seem okay and there are people with more grave situations that need to be attended to. Or they get referred to another hospital. Or they're detained for non-payment of bills. Or they end up in the mortuary whether that's because they get called home by the Lord or medical errors. <laughs> In traditional law, there are four main causes of action through which an action against a, a, a health professional will be brought. So you have negligence, assault and battery, murder, manslaughter. And we have specific provisions of law to each of these. Now the best way to avoid any of that is to make sure that informed consent is being taken. Again, the definition is where a treating medical officer discloses appropriate information to a competent patient so that the patient may make a voluntary choice to accept or refuse treatment. This affirms the patient's right to autonomy and self-determination. If we're able to do that and follow all the steps where the practitioner discusses with his or her patient the nature of the ailment, the range of available interventions, advantages and disadvantages of each, the patient's understanding of options presented, that's very important to check. Because um, like we said yesterday, you would finish going through all of that and then the patient would say, ah, I, don't, I don't really know what the doctor said. Oh. And then making sure that the patient makes a decision, discussing further with them what the potential outcomes of that decision is and most importantly, we need to remember that this patient needs to be competent. So when we talk about legal competence, we're talking about a patient being of age, 18 years and above, and having mental capacity. All of this is reiterated in the patient's charter. And for those who are not aware, the patient's charter has actually been fully adopted into our laws. And so in one of the annexes of the Public Health Act 2012, you'll find it there together with the international health regulations, which 
deals with what would happen when you have an infectious disease outbreak. So ensuring informed consent is taken, it's something that is within the control of the health practitioner. But really, for patient safety standards to be observed across board, we really do need a well-functioning health system. According to the WHO, these are the key components of a well-functioning health system. We need leadership and governance, health information systems, essential medical products and technologies, health financing, human resources for health, and service delivery. Now, we need laws that speak to each of these to be able to shape the environment properly so that each of you are able to do your work well. So on leadership and governance, we have something that we can work with for now, which is in the Health um, Professions Regulatory Bodies Act 2013. Then for health information systems, although this doesn't speak directly to health information per se, we have the Data Protection Act and um, the Communications Act as well, which also speak to, which can also help us out with information. Then we have for essential med medical products and technologies, we have the Food and Drugs Act, the original act as well as the amendment. However, it's not up to date and it doesn't cover new technologies. Then health financing, we have the National Health Insurance Act. And then on serv service delivery, we really don't have anything. The same is also true for human resources for health. So while the Health Professionals Regulatory Bodies Act talks about the likes of allied health professionals, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, what about the administrators and all the other staff that need to come together to make this happen? Of course, dietitians and whatnot will all fall under allied, allied professionals. So in terms of what we actually have now, these are the laws that speak directly to health now. We have the Health Institutions and Facilities Act. We have Health Professions Regulatory Bodies Act, which I mentioned, Health Service and Teaching Hospitals Act, Public Health Act, National Health Insurance, the Food and Drugs and Mental Health Act, and the Pharmacy Act. The Mental Health Act is actually quite forward looking and it's probably one of the best laws we have so far on health, but the implementation is also another question. I chose not to speak about policy because we've, we've talked a bit about that, touched on it here and there, but I really wanted to focus on the law because while policy is great, it only outlines the goals and then the hopes and dreams of a ministry and the methods and principles that would be used to achieve them. However, the law would set out the standards, the process, and the principles that must be followed, so it's mandatory. However, what we see, even with the laws I've listed over here, is that they're, they often lack precision or substance, and they're very sketchy in the way they've been worded. And oftentimes, they create more councils, more committees, more boards. And you find that the policies currently in place are light years ahead of the law. So the law now needs to catch up to where we are with quality improvements, patient safety, and everything else. And then, of course, you have medical technologies, and the law needs to stand up to that. Because what happens with organ transplants, human tissue, surrogacy, there's so much going on in the country right now which is not covered by any law. For surrogacy, for instance, it's mentioned briefly in the Birth and Death Registry Act, but again, there's no parent law that you can make reference to in tandem with that. So we need to have laws that are all encompassing without being so rigid that we're not able to create room for, for advances in the medical um, domain. Let's look at our institutional actors and regulatory bodies. 
So we have the Ministry of Health, Ghana Health Service. It's possible that I may have missed some, but we can draw my attention to that later. Then we have the regulatory bodies, Allied Health, Medical and Dental Council, Nursing and Midwifery, Pharmacy, Psychology, and then there's supposed to be a Health Facilities Regulatory Agency Council. I don't know how that is working at the moment, but all of these are covered by the Health Professions Regulatory Body Act. Just to give you a bit of context as to what the act actually says, um, some may already be familiar with this, but it covers the registration of medical and dental pr practitioners, nurses and midwives, and all the other professionals that are within the system. And then, of course, you've got your offenses also in there. Then we have boards, the Food and Drugs Board, Traditional Medicine Board, mortuary and funeral, and all the other regulatory boards from the previous slide, and of course, hospital boards for the management of the facilities themselves. So all of these coupled with our institutional actors can actually advance patient safety from a systemic point of view. If we take a big picture approach, recognizing that we, e we need each part of the body to function correctly to ensure that we do have a system that advances patients, patient safety and is very keen on quality improvement. So if you look at the Health Institutions and Facilities Act, that covers licensing, submission of health service data. Over there, it's required that every licensee submits data to the ministry every three months. I don't know if this is being done at all. And the registration of pathologists, the ambulance council, and then other administrative and financial provisions. So now that we've looked at what we, we have, let's think about solutions, because it's all well and good to talk about the problems, but we need to know how to fix them. The first thing I would say is that we should ensure that QI and safe, patient safety policies are in alignment with the law. At the moment, although we may not have some laws in place for certain things, we can certainly use what we have, although it would mean that some of them will have to be interpreted widely to include some of the advances. And then building that culture, we've spoken a lot about that. And then training of lawyers and health professionals as well. I say training of lawyers because if we look at a case like um, Kuma and Attorney General, this, this happened in Kumasi, Konfuanochi Teaching Hospital. A patient attended the hospital uh, with a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. And an IV line was set. This, the, the surgery was successful. However, after a while, the, she, her arm got infected where the IV line was set. And eventually, her arm needed to be amputated. Now, there are a host of medical reasons wh why that could have happened. It may not necessarily have been um, the case that the doctor was negligent. Can anyone give an idea what's, what is likely to have happened that may not necessarily have been a doctor's fault? She left the hospital, so she probably had an access point, and maybe she got infected while she was away from the hospital. Yes. And that's precisely what happened. However, in advancing a defense for the hospital, the lawyer in question did not mention that as an option. Either they didn't do their due diligence in trying to find avenues of um, defense, or they just didn't know that this was something that could have happened. So while we're training health professionals on the law, lawyers also need to be trained on the health. Um, they shouldn't just be there putting out fires when someone sues the hospital, but really they should be involved in every process, ensuring that accountability is uh, accountability steps are taken at every step. Okay. So we also need the public to be well educated. I've said before that we need new laws to catch up with medical advances. And we also need institutional reform. But I think in the long term, we also need an act that helps to shape and institutionalize the, the culture that we're talking about. So in that act, we would have 
provisions that talk about robust reporting systems, confidential patient safety data, and that will not include their general medical records or billing or discharge info. That would be in a separate system. It would only be the information that re you require to ensure that the patient's safety is maintained. And in that act as well, I'd suggest that we have provisions that affirm the patient's autonomy, also spells out clearly duties of health professionals, informed consent again, and medical errors on what to do in those instances, as well as regulatory functions and processes. But this is long term, and we need to crawl before we run. So in the meantime, let's talk about Swaziland. This is a, a country that I visited uh, last year to do a project. Now, Swaziland invited us in to write them a new public health law. However, after having meetings and looking at the system, we realized that it was in shambles. There really wasn't any real structure to how things were being done. Somehow they got things to be working. Somehow they had been able to work in such a way that they, they didn't meet any real legal challenges at the time. But they realized that they needed to update their laws as well. So they asked for a public health act. However, what they needed at our analysis was not a public health act. They needed an umbrella health act that covered the whole function of the ministry because more or less they were operating in a vacuum. So eventually, I don't know if you can see this, we came up with this structure, added a regulatory services wing, which they didn't have at all, which I think would be very useful for Ghana. But the reason why we did this was to be able to write a law that was fit for purpose, but still make it loose enough to be able to cater for advances. So to help us in the interim, in Ghana right now, I suggest that we should have something like this. Now, this will not require any, the creation of any new offices per se, because we already have licensing, people in, in charge of licensing for the various regulatory bodies. So all it means is that you'll have to have a concerted effort. Everyone comes together and then whether it's checklists that we make um, for inspectors who go into facilities to check, or whether we get QI, I don't know how it's, it's being done here at the moment, QI policies to be the same across board in every institution. And then also you would have a section for the labs and the biomedical equipment checking that everything is up to date. And then you'd have a legal affairs and enforcement department, making sure that everyone is doing what they're supposed to do at the moment. And then there's the internal review board, which I've put under legal affairs. Already, I know that the MDC, NMC, you have review boards, administrative panels that will sit if um, a doctor or a nurse's practice has been impaired. And so all it requires is for all of them to come together. And then maybe in the future, we can have something like a health tribunal. Because at the moment, our courts are so inundated with all other cases, from land issues to other civil matters, that I don't think we have the legal capacity or the space or time to be able to put that into the mainstream court system. And so maybe in the future, we'll be looking at a health tribunal. But in the meantime, we have the internal review boards that can work for us. And maybe it, it will mean that we can have one person from each regulatory body coming together to, to form that board, which can be dissolved after every meeting. Um, but the, the, the workings of that can be discussed if it's something that's of interest. 
So just to give a bit more about how that was working in Swaziland, is that if you have integrated systems, so a hospital will come up, or a doctor, nurse, any other professional has done something which, is, which has caused a patient to be disabled or to die or a complaint has come in, you're able to go into the system and see that this is what this person has done. This is the hospital. Have they had any other incidents of the sort? Is there a practice that needs to be changed? And then QI comes in and then helps to remediate that act. So this is just uh, the licensing department broadened, just to say what else would go there. Medical products, hospitals, clinics, permits, imports, and whatnot. And then the same for inspection. So they'll inspect medical devices, healthcare service facilities, and then you have your public health inspectors which, who will inspect the environment, food and all of that um, because if, if we do have an infectious disease outbreak, which we pray that we don't, we'll probably be <laughs> in trouble with the way things uh, are run at the moment. So in closing, I'd like to say we need to act fast and we need to act now because uh, times are changing and there's a lot that needs to be done in the interim. Policies are improving and yet the law is lagging behind. And as the policies improve, it's not being done in tandem with the law at all. And we might end up in a situation where a case may be brought up and then suddenly it's said that there's no leg to stand on for that because there's no basis in the Constitution or in any other legal document. So we really need to think about these issues and try and look at the big picture so that we can have a more safe, system that citizens can trust. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Hayford. These last two topics are something that we as health professionals don't tend to think about very much. But it is really crucial that as part of our practice, we are conversant with what happens so that if there are issues or if there's fallout, we know exactly where to go and what to do. Our next speaker, and it's in this vein that the next speaker was introduced, I saw an article in one of the papers about calibration of medical equipment and mm -hmm. the importance of it. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, a lot of us have absolutely no idea. Mm. We get up, we pick the equipment, we use it, it works, it doesn't work. We get a figure, we record something. That's true. So I decided to invite the department um, at the Ghana Standards Authority, GSE, that's right. And Mr. Paul Date is worked with the authority for 24 years as a metrologist, not meteorologist, metrologist. <laughs> He's the current head of scientific metrology and part of his training includes quality management systems. He's also an executive member of the Intra-Africa Metrology Systems, AFRIMET. He's a past vice president of AFRIMET, a position he held for four years, from 2011 to 2015. And he's a past member of the Pan-African Quality Infrastructure, PACI. Currently, he's a council member of the ECOWAS, set by the ECOWAS Commission, and funded by the German government and the EU. And he's going to talk to us about calibration of medical devices as it relates to quality care. Thank you, Mr. Rati. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, my duty this afternoon 
is to speak about calibration of medical devices. Are you hearing me? And uh, what we need to think about. So first brief introduction of where I work. The Ghana Standards Authority uh, performs two major functions. One, it is a national standards body, and two, is a conformity assessment body. Now, the services provided are what has been listed there. Standards development, testing, inspection, certification, calibration and verification, library information, training, and public education. Now, the other issue is what is metrology. As uh, Professor Hesse said, uh, it is not meteorology. Meteorology is for those who declare the weather for us after the news has been rendered. But this is talking about measurement. Metrology is derived from the Greek word called metron. Metron in Greek means to measure. So it was from this Greek word metron that the English word metrology was derived. So metrology, simply put, is the science of measurement or the art of measurement. And measurement can be theoretical or it can be practical. So the science of measurement includes both the theoretical aspect and the practical aspect. Now, in which areas do we apply metrology, or for that matter, measurement? Almost every human activity, we do measurement, either consciously or unconsciously. Um, if you want to have some tea, you may ask whether you want uh, it hot or cold. Um, if you want to drink water, uh, some people prefer cold water. And sometimes it is to the extreme that is cold water taken immediately from the freezer, which is getting, becoming almost blocked. So if you want to eat food, doctors will advise that we eat food that is not cold. So all these are forms of measurement. But now, thankful to technology, so we use instruments to do the measurement in order to be precise or to be accurate. Now, in terms of measurement, we have calibration and verification. These are the two activities that you do under metrology. Now, as uh, medical practitioners, you use a lot of instruments um, in order to diagnose diseases. Or, yeah, even in the laboratory, when you are asked to go for lab test, uh, the technicians there will have to use instruments to arrive at a, a conclusion for the doctor's consideration. So the question is, how accurate are these devices, either at the outpatient department or in the laboratories? Sometimes in the doctor's consulting room, you have a uh, sphinx they will use to also check your pressure, sometimes to confirm what the nurse has put down on your card. Um, it is always better to have some of these things calibrated, because when they are not calibrated, you have problems. So when you want to talk about the importance of calibration, we say that accurate diagnosis or investigations will depend on accurate measurements. Um, and what are some of the measurements? Uh, we, we, we do body mass index, and for body mass index, you need the weight, you need the height. Sometimes you take 
blood pressure, you take body temperature. These are basic measurements that are done in the hospitals. Now, then you have the complex ones where you have drugs in blood or urine, radiation for cancer treatment, HIV testing, and so on and so forth. Now, um, the two most important determinants of measurement accuracy are the skills of the health professional and then the calib calibration of the measuring instrument. Um, the skills here, we are referring to the experience. The person operating the instrument must be trained on how to use it. Sometimes, uh, especially weighing instrument. I've gone to places where you realize that uh, the person doing the weighing is not so experienced. He lacks some basic understanding. Even the weighing instrument, there is a way you need to handle it. If you don't handle it well, you won't get good results. So even when it is not being used, you must take good care of it. So all this, the operator has to know, or the person using the weighing instrument has to know. And then also, even in procurement, you must know what you want to use the scale for, or the instrument for, before procuring it. Because sometimes you can procure an instrument which, even though procured, will not help you realize your objective. So skills of health professionals is important. They have to be trained on the use of the instrument. And then they will have to do a calibration of the instruments, not by themselves, because uh, they will have to send it to another organization that is uh, endowed to do that. Otherwise, uh, you will spend a lot of money in that aspect. Then uh, we have in terms of calibrating the health devices, some of the devices, like I mentioned, are clinical thermometers, fixed weighing scales, ovens, medical fridges, blood banks, and cold rooms. Um, we have some experiences. So if you go to the hospital, which we have experienced, and uh, we calibrated a weighing instrument, and then after the calibration, uh, the nurse realized that uh, her weight, which she knew, had fallen short by 10 kilograms, which meant that initially she knew her weight was 83 kilograms. But after the calibration, she realized that her weight is not 83 kilograms, but 93, for which region, reason she has to be concerned. But prior to that, she thought she was OK. And then also, years back, we had one of our directors who had some stroke and was receiving medical attention in one of the major hospitals in Ghana. And uh, he visited for routine checks. And then they doubled the dosage of the medication. So he realized that any time he took the drugs, his uh, body feeling wasn't good. So once he was a director at the place, he knew the implications of some of these things. So fortunately, the wife was a nurse. They went to buy a stick. They brought it, we calibrated, and then they used it to check the husband's uh, pressure. And they realized that the readings were far lower. And uh, they had to go and talk to the doctor. And then they, they realized that the sphic that was used had a problem. So in this case, if he didn't know, he would have continued and uh, on and on. And only God knows what would have happened. So we have so many. Uh, we've also visited health facilities where all the thermometers were disqualified. 
they, 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 they weren't functioning. And these were thermometers they had bought less than a month before. So there are a whole lot of issues. We've also done some kind of re investigation on how vaccines are received, sent to the central stores, distributed to the end user. And you can tell that there are issues. Just like Professor was saying, uh, there are issues. So these are issues that sometimes are not being considered, you know. But they are also the very things which, if we consider, will go a long way to impact positively on the work that we do. So um, domestic skills, for example, we don't use them for uh, serious medical work. And so sometimes you realize that even with the polio things they do every year, if the potency of the vaccine is not there, you realize that you keep giving the dosage and giving the dosage, and you are not seeing what you expect. So all these things, what we are saying is that uh, calibration of the medical devices are very, very important, even with the fridges. You see, some are using domestic fridges, which is not right. There are medical fridges you need to buy. The domestic fridges are used to preserve the food we cook at home, the Coke, Sprite, your jollof, fried rice, stuff like that. They are meant for that. So we should not cause inflation of domestic fridges by patronizing them into the hospital. So <laughs> um, we went to a hospital. They said, oh, they had used this medical freezer for a long time. So they had auctioned it. And the person who bought it had not even come for it. So they had gone to buy a brand new freezer. So when we got there, we insisted that we should calibrate the two, both the old and the new. It took quite a while for them to understand. And after the calibration, the brand new freezer failed. And the old one which they thought was not good was perfect. It was solid in terms of the readings. And so they had to call the guy, apologized, and asked him to come for the refund of his money. Since it was still a good freezer for their use. So you see, if the calibration had not come in, they would have made a very big mistake. And sometimes you keep reagents for laboratory tests in there. And these regions, some of them are supposed to be kept at a particular temperature. So you can imagine the result if they had uh, asked the guy to come for it and use the new freezer. So it is important that uh, these devices are periodically calibrated so that you have the assurance that the instrument is still fit for purpose. So I just put some slides uh, called the BIPM Global. Now the BIPM is just there representing the International Bureau for Waste and Measures. That's the international body that binds all of us together. And uh, the purpose is to ensure that measurement is uniform across the world. All of us speak the same language, so that one kilogram in Ghana is also one kilogram in Taiwan, in Japan, anywhere in the world. So we must all subscribe to the systems that are put in place by this uh, international body with the headquarters in Paris. So whatever we do in Ghana, has traceability to the international standard. So we don't operate alone. We also have to obey and follow the norm. Just as the institutions are traceable to us, we are also traceable to the international body. And in Ghana, only some of the hospitals, I'll say, 
uh, have approached us and we do calibration for them. But in most cases, it is only limited to their laboratories, which is not, uh, doesn't go far enough. So uh, it is important that the outpatient department is also included, not only the outpatient, but even the other departments. You talk of the um, maternity, children's blocks, all the other departments where these devices are used, it is important that we have those ones also calibrated. So on this note, what I'll say is that um, the, med the measuring instruments or the weighing instruments for that matter must at all times work very well and throughout the whole period of use within the permissible error. And once we can achieve that through calibration, it will even help us to plan better. Once you do the calibration, even one or two years before the instrument goes off, you can tell from the records that you have previously. So nothing will surprise you. So on this note, I think I will conclude by saying that it is important that uh, we calibrate these devices. And it is very, very, very important. Sometimes if we show you the details of the results we have from some hospitals, it will shock you. So thank you for your attention. be open for questions, but maybe I'll take my prerogative and ask my questions first. Uh, Mrs. Hayford, that was uh, very good. Can you tell us a little bit about the reach of the Data Protection Act, which you mentioned? Because recently, a number of health institutions, educational institutions were threatened in the papers with uh, um, legal action. And uh, or sanctions, and it was not clear whose responsibility exactly in that institution or in the body, whether it's Ministry of Health or whatever, is responsible for that and how it applies. Then um, perhaps for both of you, Mr. Date and uh, Elsie, talking about lawsuit, uh, about faulty equipment, could there be lawsuits arising out of faulty equipment have there been lawsuits arising out of faulty equipment? And in that case, who is liable? Um, the question about uh, faulty equipment. In fact, once the equipment is faulty and it is used, and then the unlikely thing happens and the person is able to trace then um, I'm not too sure about the laws but it's either the institution and then the people who use the instrument will be held <laughs> either jointly or severally as the lawyers put it but then once you do the calibration the calibration documentation that will be given to you is what is going to absorb you from blame. You see, that is the catchy word here. Once you do what is expected of you regarding quality, the certificate, then beyond that there is what we call intermediate checks. You do them and record them in your books. When something happens, you can always prove that whatever due diligence was expected of you was done. And for that reason, it cannot be attributed to you. Thank you. I agree with Mr. Dase. The hospital will be held vicariously liable if there was faulty equipment. And I'm sure that after that, if 
the management of the hospital went into the records and found that someone who was responsible for making sure that the equipment was serviced did not do their job, then internal disciplinary procedures will, will kick in. And then secondly, under the DPA, the problem with that act is that there's supposed to be a commission as well as um, a governing body for the commission. But that hasn't taken effect yet. Secondly, in terms of health as it relates to the Data Protection Act, like I said in the presentation, we don't have any health law that speaks specifically to the protection of health data. And so it's a bit sketchy when you get into the letter of the law, and then you now have to interpret it widely, stretch it to make sure that the health information in question fits right in. So it's a challenge that needs to be addressed, and we need to have more specific provisions that speak to it, otherwise the implementation and then redress when there are issues will, will, will constantly be a problem. Well, to some extent, because we really don't have a leg to stand on at the moment. But again, um, from a legal perspective, there will be different pieces of legislation, I anticipate, which will be pulled together to, but we can talk about that further. But as the DPA stands, there's nothing specifically that covers and then we asked about an example of a patient safety policy uh, that is good in itself but violates the law. Uh, yeah. I so far haven't come across a patient safety policy that didn't have a backing law. However, it is possible that you can have a policy that is in place, but then maybe the laws of the land don't say anything about um, discriminatory um, practices or anything of the sort, and then that brings into question everything that the policy has said, and the policy then has no legal backing to support it. And so that's something that could be looked at, but across the African continent, I've hardly found a patient safety policy that also had a law attached to it. Do you have a one? No, the for patient safety now, but for quality improvement, it may violate the, the law about the freedom, the, the personal information protection. Can you raise some examples of that? Again, with, with patient protection of patient information, there could be other laws around apart from, so perhaps the situation in Taiwan, I'm not sure, but perhaps there are other laws that you have, maybe an information act. Electronic Communications Act, something al along those lines, which step in if it doesn't speak specifically about patient safety. And I'm very sure also from the presentations that were given that there must be an occupational health and safety um, law that is also in place. Jamie Takramakra, College of Medicine. Uh, this question to Paul. Uh, has GSA the capacity to calibrate medical instruments uh, in Ghana? if requested to do so. That's for Paul. And then to, for Elsie, uh, what happens when a patient and then a caregiver are both responsible for a disability that uh, a patient might, might get? What do you do? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Abdul Salam Mohammed, Kulebu Tichin Hospital. Uh, to Elsie, I must say congratulations for such a fantastic presentation. Uh, which organization in Ghana or institution do you think must champion the cause of these reforms that you have mentioned? And I don't know if it's possible we could have your presentation. Maybe we could present our, our emails and then you could give us your presentation. To Mr. Paul, uh, I think your presentation is quite an eye-opener because I have been through the health training as a nurse and I've never come across such a topic being discussed in our training institutions on calibrations and what have you. But it tells us that this issue of quality and patient safety is a systemic issue. We have to look at it comprehensively and holistically. What you have not uh, said in your presentation, at least for the purpose of understanding, what exactly you mean by calibration and an example of 
how calibration is done so that we are able to understand effectively. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for brilliant presentations. Uh, truly, um, my question is to both speakers. I'm Mimuna Tango, National Health Insurance Authority. First, on the law and medical records. Um, um, we have written at the back of the medical records, private and confidential, and they are supposed to be kept at the facilities um, for continuity of care and for research for countries. Um, but invariably, we have patients carrying their medical records home. In the event that your medical records get into the hands of a third party, who is responsible, the patient or the facility? Um, <laughs> with regards with calibration, uh, because of uh, microeconomic dynamics in our country, for instance, you have many health practitioners uh, procuring equipment for themselves. So I go to a hospital, I have my speed in my bag, I have my thermometer, I have my um, other equipment that will aid my work. In the event that there is, um, <laughs> <laughs> what happens? Um, is it me or the facility? Uh, and if I, I, I procure my personal equipment to aid my work, do I have to bring it to standards board for calibration? Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm Adnanate from Kolebu. Um, Mr. Bafo, um, I want to know if um, in Kolebu we have a team called Biomedical. They are in charge of our uh, equipment. I'm specifically from the IC, okay, where we use a lot of gadgets. I want to know if these particular people are being trained by you to do the calibrations for us. Because like Auntie Bemuna said, um, we purchase our own things. Like we come for our life support machines, Draga. Those people come to install all those things. But I have never seen, um, like the way you presented, I didn't know you are the ones to be doing the calibrations. The life support keeps alarming, keeps alarming. Or our cardiac monitors will go off for that night and patient is on it. We have to wait or call biomedical to come in. I just want to know if things are being brought to you for the calibration or those people who bring the things to us, they are in partnership with you for the calibration. Then the next one is from oxygen, you know, our plants. Um, with ICU, we don't joke. You take up, you check all your meters, where your gauges are before you start work. Gauges are okay. You'll be there, patient is on life support, and then machine starts alarming. You go and check on all your gauges, air is off. You have oxygen vacuum working, but you don't have air, so your patient ends up not being ventilated. I want to know if you also check on our oxygen plants, what they deliver through our walls. And then if there is a policy, like all facilities buying things, they are supposed to pass through you first. Because I hardly see you guys around. That, that's my question. But I want to uh, thank the presenters for their wonderful presentation. Um, but to the standard uh, the standard authority or the Ghana standard authority um, since I started my practice 1992 till now initially I knew that uh, Minister of Health used to buy these equipment and distribute to the hospitals and send their uh, people around to calibrate them for staff to use and train them as well but for some time I don't know whether because we, we, we became Ghana Health Service. It's difficult to see these equipments coming around again. And then institutions are asked to buy their own equipments. You make the advert specifying the type of fridge you want, and the suppliers will come telling you they've roamed around the whole country. They cannot get that kind of fridge. You pass through uh, the epidemiology the, uh, department in Accra to see whether they could help you. And it's like, it's not possible. So sometimes you end up to have something instead of nothing. Because you, you definitely need the fridges to store your vaccines. So you end up buying the wrong fridge. And every year, 
they will come round and disqualify them, present their reports, but nothing happens. And we continue to use them like that. So I don't know. Uh, can't Ghana Health Service take that up and buy these equipment, making sure that they are the right equipment, and distribute to the hospitals? Right. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm glad the, the Deputy Director General, Ghana Health Service, is right behind you, so she has heard you. Uh, if you want to speak to God, you speak to the wind. So Thank you very much. Mine is a very simple one. I wanted to find out <laughs> the role you play when it comes to cleaning of these equipment. The reason being that there are times you don't know the right disinfectant to use. You use a particular disinfectant, the engineers come and they tell you have spoiled the machine, you have done this and that. So I don't know, because when they come and install it, the manufacturer's guidelines is with them. So you don't know what the manufacturer wants you to use. And you know, we have this infection prevention and control policy. That spells out what you can use for what. The disinfectant you can use for, a um, for what equipment. And we use it and it's like it has caused a problem. So it creates problem for the end users and the engineers. I don't know what role you play in terms of giving us standard cleaning disinfect or cleaning agents that we can use on these equipment. Thank you. Thank you. I want to congratulate the uh, presenters for a good job done and also to thank the organizers for choosing this very important topic. I'm sure this one and a half days, there are more things we'd have liked to hear and learn, but it's good to have a wake up call on uh, quality issues. I just want to say that um, the Ministry of Health now has come up with a national healthcare quality strategy. Um, quality is one of the um, things that was mentioned as a priority in, in our current uh, program of work, which ends um, in 2017. So in 2016, a lot was done about quality. Situation analysis was done. And it's mostly quality of services. And that was a gap in um, a lawyer's um, uh, presentation. So we have a, a strategy. And it's not in vacuum, but the strategy is there to put uh, things together and let us uh, move forward. And it includes a monitoring and evaluation aspect, which has real um, indicators that we should be looking at. Within the Ghana Health Service, quality is also a big issue for us. In fact, anyone who is providing services should be very interested in quality, whether you have a, a law or a policy, but it's good that we have laws and policies. So we have quality in several aspects, quality issues in several aspects of our work that we should be very concerned about. But what I'm seeing here too is that during training, and in uh, pre-service and in-service training, these quality issues should come up um, very high. I, I can't answer all the questions. It will take a long time. But I'm, I'm, th those are the points I'm seeing. Now, with um, the other thing is when we do things as various um, areas, we, we have to share our findings and then implement the recommendations. A lot of times we have like standards authorities saying, I don't know whether the hospitals you went to, when you finished, you shared the information with the uh, people on the ground and brought some uh, maybe up to a higher level. But we really have to implement uh, recommendations when we find um, some flaws. And I think it is for all of us. It's not for one particular institution, or this, but for all the uh, institutions to come together. And um, now specifically to, no, before I finish with the strategy, the health service strategy um, that the ministry had was also showing us that th they are trying to put things together because we have regulatory bodies like the Medical and Dental Council, Food and Drugs Authority, regulating quality of uh, health professionals for uh, the, the Medical and Dental Council and for Food um, and Drugs Authority, like um, the drugs <coughs> and the foods. But nobody was actually uh, comprehensively 
looking at the uh, services, even though the service uh, delivery agencies are working on it. So that policy brings everything together. And within that also, the uh, Health uh, Facilities Regulatory Agency, which has um, replaced the private maternity boards, now has to also um, regulate the public sector. You know, public sector um, facilities were not regulated uh, under the uh, private maternity board. So we are trying to put that together as a country. And I think that your presentation was very brilliant and we should maybe take it as a, a policy brief to the minister and move some of these things forward. I'm happy that you are saying that policy is ongoing and they, we have to catch up with law. So at least we are not operating in vacuum, but we need a lot to do. Now with the WA, is it WA? Ghana Health Service, the equipment. You see, in the past, we, we used to buy the equipment and distribute it. And we still do for some programs and projects. And when we do that, we go uh, for, the, now we have the Procurement Act. You have to put your specifications and what comes should be um, a quality thing. And when it comes, we do calibrate them. And I think Standards Authority, when we had Ebola, the Ebola um, scare, and we bought the thermometers. That's a very good example. Some thermometers were brought in, and then later on they found out that it, the temperature range for those thermometers was not, it wasn't human, it was for industri industry. Mm -hmm. So they recalled all of them, and we got the human one. I just want us to appreciate that we have a system that is working. We talk to each other, but maybe not that well. So uh, I think we should keep up the, um, that's good work. Now, when you buy the, the thermometers and things at your level, you have to um, put specifications there. And then if you have any, um, you, we have quality assurance teams and we also have clinical engineering department. So we should work together with them and make sure that we have um, done some calibration. I think the standards authority helps us, but we also have a clinical um, the equipment department, which the biomedical engineering, which goes around also working on our, uh, uh, on our equipment. The last I want to say is that when it comes to um, taking care of the equipment also, we are given equipment and people are trained on how to use it, very minimal training. So our, our training, uh, the equipment don't last. So this preventive uh, management is something that we are looking at, that people should be well trained to manage the equipment when it comes to um, using bleach or something to clean them. That balance um, should be there. So we actually need to be talking uh, to each other. It's not one uh, person's uh, uh, domain, but we really have to appreciate uh, the teamwork. Thank you very much. I've talked for long. Thank you. <laughs> the first question on if a patient reports with a disability, um, that has occurred through the patient's own fault and that of the caregiver. With that, once they report at the hospital and the health professionals are able to put down good records saying this is how the person came and this is, this is the advice that I have been given, that then absolves you of any liability as a health professional because the onus then is, is on, on them and not on yourself. So quite simply, that's the answer to that one. And then which organization to present this information to? I would say the ministry, the health service, um, much as we're doing a lot of work in, at the district level and also at the level of the hospitals, it's also important that we have things coming from the top as well. And so it will be good if we can push that from that perspective too. And then Dr. Tanko's question on um, the law and medical records. Again, we don't have a records, medical records law, but we do have a policy. And the policy, I think it was, it was published in November last year. So I have it here. And it says that the medical record is the property of the health facility and shall be maintained for the benefit of the patient, the medical staff, and the health facility. It is the responsibility of the health facility to safeguard both the record and its content against loss, defacement, tampering, or use by, by unauthorized individuals. 
and particular emphasis should be given to protection from damage by fire or water. So it's there. We have a policy. And it says that's the responsibility of the health facility. And it even goes on to talk about how they should be stored and that the records department need to be provided with sufficient space. And so it looks like perhaps in practice, the, the resources or the space isn't, isn't even there for that to happen. But according to the policy, it's the responsibility of the hospital to store the, the medical records. Okay, um, I think that was all. And then also just to comment on the deputy director's um, comments. It's great to see that there's a national health care policy strategy. I'm very happy to see that. And I look forward to seeing it's actually being put into the letter of the law because that's absolutely necessary and would go a long way to um, consolidate all the efforts that are being made at the moment. Thank you. Um, the first question was, has GSA the capacity to calibrate medical equipment in Ghana? I'll say that for the basic ones, uh, GSA has the capacity to calibrate them. And uh, we don't want to build capacity for which will not be used. So as and when uh, more equipment are brought to our doorstep, capacity will be built to handle all those ones. So this time, our operations are a bit, let me say, demand-driven because of scarce resources. So the capacity is there. And two, the question is, uh, what is calibration? Calibration in simple language is comparing the readings of a standard instrument which we keep for the country with the instrument that the medical facility has submitted to us. So if the difference in readings is too high, then we will have to alert you that uh, the equipment is no longer useful for the purpose. So basically, it's a comparison process. We use the national standard to compare with the readings of the instrument you have submitted to us. And just as we are doing for you, we must also have our instruments, the reference ones, compared to the international. So that is why I made the point that we are not in isolation. We are also being monitored for what we do. Then the next question is, personal equipment, do I bring it to GSA? Um, since you are using it for the work, uh, you will have to bring it to GSA for calibration. And at this point, I want to say that uh, when you are buying a feed, you must be careful. It will be better if you talk to us because we cannot calibrate all the different brands of sphix in the country. Uh, some we cannot calibrate because um, before we do that, the manufacturer of the sphix must send to us his adapters. It is the adapters from the manufacturer who will give us the connectivity between our standard and that of your speak. So some of the manufacturers have complied. They've given us the adapters. So we don't have the full complement of adapters of all the models. So when you are buying, please be careful. Do well to talk to us. Because there's no point in buying an instrument you cannot calibrate. Once a while, people bring them, we tell them we cannot calibrate. And it will not be helpful if you continue to use it. Because some are told they have high blood pressure for which they don't. And then the next question is oxygen plant with ICU. Um, this one, what I'll say is that the 
No, the next one is the biomedical department. Now, the biomedical department is the maintenance department for all the faci medical facilities. So we call them the maintenance department, if you want to put it that way. So it is their responsibility to maintain all the instruments, make sure they are working. For us, we are interested in the accuracy of the instrument. That's where the distinction comes in. We are interested in the accuracy. Okay? So that is where the line comes in. So when you come to the oxygen plant, over here, it is the responsibility of the biomedical engineering department to ensure but the other side of it from the gsa side you are talking of oxygen what is the purity of the oxygen that is where we'll be interested in what is the purity are you meeting the purity standard of the oxygen or not you see then uh, the other question borders on procurement in hospitals now, the advice we will give is that anytime you are procuring equipment from manufacturers, sometimes it is through suppliers, you have to insist, especially when it's going to be a tender, you have to insist on what we call patent approval or COC or third party certification. You must insist on some of these documents. If you come and talk to us, we will help you to indicate that in your tender document so that it is entrenched in the tender document so that if that is not met, there is no way you will proceed to buy that equipment. That is for your own protection. Once you follow that procedure, you will save yourself the danger of buying most of these instruments that are not too good, having problems with quality. And then uh, cleaning of equipment. Normally when the instruments have been installed, um, biomedical engineers can keep the original manual or brochure but then you need a photocopy at where the equipment has been installed so that you know what kind of uh, chemical you have to use for the cleaning. And in fact, when it's installed, there is something we call installation training. Installation training. So during installation training, they must teach you on how to maintain or how to use the equipment. Because if you buy TV or mobile phone and you don't read the manual, even though it will be expensive, the utilization of the mobile phone will be very small. You may only make calls, receive text messages, and that ends it. All the other functions cannot be enabled. It is when you have read the manual, then you know the other functions that are in there for your use. So it is the same thing for equipment. So we have to take note of that. It creates a lot of problems. Then uh, national, okay, then the last thing is uh, training. What we want to say is that uh, we also do training uh, for health professionals. So once the big lady is here um i'm only using the opportunity to inform the house that we do training for health professionals we do not hesitate once we are contacted we'll do it last year we were contacted uh, we told them what we can do and how we should go about it so we are still waiting for them to come back to us so that that training can be affected. And even though we are under the Ministry of Trade and Industry, Ghana Standards Authority's functions 
cuts across all the ministries in Ghana, all agencies, MDAs, whatever. We are only under Ministry of Trade for budgetary purposes. But the work we do has no exception when it comes to many, even inflation, how to calculate it. There is an input we have to do in order that you get uh, results that are of integrity. If you go to sports, everything. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I also have a question for Dr. Kwanza. <laughs> you mentioned about the Ghana National Healthcare Quality Strategy. Uh, we are interested in where you include the strategy into the hospital accreditation in the future. Yes, there was a lot of uh, stakeholder analysis. There was a situation analysis and stakeholder involvement. So this strategy is um, sitting at the Ministry of Health. And it will be, no, what I mean, if I say sitting, that it means that it's at the highest level. And it's going to operate in every level, all levels, from community to district to regional uh, to national. It's quite uh, comprehensive. And the team is still working on it. We've had a few stakeholder engagement. But it is a national uh, strategy which will be shared. I mean, everyone, there's a stakeholder. Everyone is a stakeholder. And then, Doctor, I think your, um, one of your slides, you put Ministry of Health and Ghana Health Service as the mm -hmm. service providers. Mm -hmm. And you said we can add on. So you add the um, faith-based, the quasi, and the uh, private. So everyone providing services will be uh, under uh, under that side of your slide, so that we are all uh, part of it. Thank you very much. Uh, about the uh, uh, particular equipment to buy, the, the I wanted to recommend, is it possible, sir, because I don't know how your organizational structure looks. Everybody can't come to Ghana Standards Authority. So is it possible that at the um, some of the apex hospitals or the regional hospitals, they have either a list of what you recommend for each type of instrument should be bought. That way people can go to their regional facilities and get this information instead of everybody coming to you. The other possibility is having a hotline that physicians or other um, allied staff can call when they need to procure this equipment to have somebody respond to their equipment issues. The other thing I wanted to mention is staff turnover, because you mentioned installation training. And this is often done, and sometimes there's staff turnover, and the person you trained has left and has not moved on the duplicate manual to the next person. And so the, 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 the next set of staff have to struggle over the equipment. So that it may be something you would want to um, look at as you engage with the facilities. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> mine is a short one. It's more about clarity. Uh, I think uh, verification and, uh, and then um, calibration are not mutually exclusive. I believe in the work of the Ghana Standards Board, they, they can do just verification, going around filling stations, finding out whether if they say it's a liter, indeed you are getting a liter. But you cannot carry out calibration without verification because calibration will have to start with verification, whether really the equipment is, is, uh, is, 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 is accurate. You could do uh, uh, a verification and that may not lead to calibration because you verify and the equipment is okay. So I could bring about uh, 10 pieces of equipment and three of them will pass the verification test. And then uh, you may have to then do your calibration on the seven. So this is my understanding of it. Normally, verification, the other name, verification comes under legal metrology. Um, and verification, the difference between the two is that in terms of verification, the permissible errors 
are stated by law. The permissible errors, when it is verification, they are stated by law. So any instrument that is used for which there are laws governing them, we call them legal metrology instruments. One, it has to do with commerce. You mentioned the filling station, commerce. Then you are talking of environment, instruments used for the environment. Like you want to uh, sanction people for making noise, you understand. Or people uh, drunk driving, you know, these kind of instruments, we call them legal instruments. And then we have health, also coming under legal framework. Now, for calibration, you want to establish the integrity of your instrument. So you subject that instrument for calibration. And uh, after calibration, we give you the certificate. And in the certificate, we will indicate the error, or let me say the performance, and then advise you appropriately. But here, like one of the participants said, turnover of staff. If the staff is not well qualified, even when I state that error, and they are using the certificate, they must use the instrument having in mind the results that have been stated in the certificate. If they cannot do that very well, and it will create problems, then you have to replace it or repair it. So this explanation gives you the difference between verification and calibration. Um, when we talk of everybody coming to G, uh, GSA, um, we have a procurement department at the Ministry of Health. And I believe the other hospitals and facilities also have procurement departments. So we can work through these structures and then resolve these issues. Um, we have had a few contacts, like she said, from the procurement department of the ministry. Um, and I think the collaboration is increasing, and that is a good sign for the future. And then staff turnover. Um, it is important that any time they are doing training, as many people as possible that can be made available will be better. Mm, the presentation of... Oh. conference and my very able chairman oh, thank you so much thank you so much thank you so much there we see there okay okay thank you they have thank been thank you everybody they have been very consistent this is the third one. And every time we come, we learn so much. My concern is that we need to push things forward a little bit more from just the talk, talk. You know, we really need to. The way we have had so many examples from the health system, there's so much we can pick. So that at the next time, what we're going to do is to give opportunity for people to come and present their experiences from the previous conferences that we have heard and how far they have put things into motion and how far they have gone. I think that is what we will put up as our theme for the next time. Um, I'd like to thank also Kolebu Teaching Hospital, co-hosts, 
together. Who's in the centre? <laughs> we are in the centre. I'd like to thank Tang Palace, Dr. Yeah. Thank you so much you. for yeah. supporting and organizing. Yeah. Wonderful support. Yeah. We've had a very good conference. We've been very comfortable. And we want to thank you all very much. Then the ACM team. ACM team. Yeah. Give me a wave. Oh. Yeah, thank thank you. you very much. Ghana Health Service. Thank you so much for being there and always supporting us. You have been always very active yeah, and you. supporting us. That. Radio Universe. Radio Universe is a strong partner with Accra College of Medicine. We organize monthly public lectures. And they're on various topics. And you're all invited. And every time they come, they cover. And it's immediately on YouTube. In fact, yesterday I was told we were streaming live on Facebook. So people heard about this conference from Facebook. So thank you very much, Radio Universe. Yeah. And we believe the partnership will continue. OK, so I'll ask my co-chairs to just say a few words. Colin. I would want to thank all participants for making this a great success. Uh, I think I will take a cue from what uh, my teacher just said, that we go beyond the talk. Uh, I am advocate for that. Um, I want to see action. So and as my uh, senior colleague will tell you, Dr. Noti, he said, I see my didn't talk plenty. So I'm warning here. I want to thank all of you on behalf of management and board of college. Thank you very much. OK. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Ghana Health Service is grateful to be part of um, your conferences. We have been part of it from the inception. And we learn a lot. And we are also ready to support whatever you are doing. We don't have money, though. <laughs> but. We support with uh, whatever we have. So um, thank you very much uh, for having us. And some of our staff have come. And I'm sure that they'll go back and share what has been done. Thank you so much. Thank you. OK. Uh, on behalf of the Taiwan part co-organizer, uh, we would like to thank GHS, uh, ACM, Korebu, KBTH, and uh, all of you to join us for this important conference and the meaningful uh, presentation from uh, different scholars and professionals. Uh, we look forward to the first, the first West Africa Taiwan Health Promotion Conference coming. And uh, we also expect some of you can sue our exchange program to visit to our hospital for share uh, the experience each other. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. And we are leaving this afternoon. I think very soon we should set up a Taiwan Ghana Association of people who have visited the institution who will come back and maybe become the agents of change within our institution. Thank you all very much for your participation. Before Solomon. I come from India. I am a public health practitioner with an MD degree in community medicine from India. Uh, I was really uh, very happy in uh, attending this conference because in this one conference, as expected, the conference went fabulous. There was an uh, intercultural and intercontinental exchange of knowledge in how we can improve the patient safety and quality ins insurance. Really, this is the need of the hour, especially in Ghana at this moment. As we see many cases happening where patients are not taken at the center of the system, where also a um, lot of mishappenings happen within the hospital system within, against the patient. But this moment, we have all come to realize, both the doctors and the paramedics, that 
we need to focus back on the patient and also the ways in which we can do. We are really thankful to the Taiwan uh, team of doctors as well as the Ghanian team of doctors who have done an excellent job. We are really thankful to all the sponsors, Korlebu and Accra Medical College and the Taiwan Colleges. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Abdus Salam Mohammed. I'm a senior nursing officer at Kolibu Teaching Hospital, also administrative secretary for nursing audit. Uh, basically, uh, this conference on health promotion, quality, and patient safety has been a very important uh, eye opener for me because some of the issues discussed on patient safety are issues that ordinarily health workers don't really see as important indicators. Uh, for actually patient safety. So especially the uh, most important aspect of the whole conference for me has to do with the issue of the legalities involved as far as patient safety is concerned. And most importantly and finally, the issue of calibration, calibration of the medical equipment we use. Nobody will even think about it, but it's an important factor that goes into patient, uh, health quality and patient safety. So I'm very much impressed. I hope systematically we can do something to improve upon the quality of healthcare that we discharge in this country. Thank you very much. Um, as Nanate, a nursing officer from Kolibu ICU, um, my expectation has quite been met and, and it's even above what happened today is above my expectation because um, when we talk of patient safety Today, I have learned, for these past two days, I have learned, it's not basically about staff, staffs alone, but it's with the system all together. And this thing about calibration and things, it, it has really opened my mind. And, and I think when I get back, I'm just going to check if all my life supports, my cardiac monitors, my perfusers and physiomats, virtually my ECG machines, everything have been calibrated to standard. And I, I'll make sure I check for the certification because I've learned today there should be a third party, a second party certification to all equipment that are being bought. So good news to those who organize this program. And I hope in two years' time, we'll have better things to discuss. Thank you. Um, the third West African Taiwan promotion, health promotion conference um, the topics were chosen, the, the main theme was chosen bilaterally between us and the Taiwanese, especially Professor Lee and Professor Yang from um, Taichung Hospital. And the idea is to see how our shared experiences can help improve patient safety and quality of health care. As we have learned over the past two days, Patient-centeredness is key, putting the patient at the center of all we do. And we all acknowledge, Nigeria, Ghana, Taiwan, that unless we do that, we are failing because we as health professionals are there really only because the patients are there. If we have no patients, we have no job. So that's something that to keep in mind.